A lot of you have been asking for more content about men's kimono and I thought I really should get to do this, finally. And what is best to start with than history? In case you're here for the first time, my name is Billy Matsunaga and I'm a fully trained and certified kimono teacher and stylist. Why did it take me so long to finally make a video about men's kimono? The answer is easy. I find men's kimono extremely boring. And I'm not talking about the missing color variations or the obi arrangement fun. Oh wait, no, that's exactly it. <laughs> but have you ever wondered why men's kimono have less variation in kimono itself and obi arrangements? Those answers can be found in garment history. But before we get started, I really have to stress that I am trying to put as much pictures into this video as copyright allows me to. And instead of complaining when you find a picture missing, I think a little bit of research on your own won't hurt you. Usually my kimono garment history videos start in the Heian era, but this time I wanna start earlier in the Nana period. During that time, several laws were issued that told you what colors you're allowed to wear or how your hair has to be set. And most of the one important laws at that time is the law that tells you that you have to wear the left collar over the right collar. You might have heard that you have to wear left over right because the other way would indicate that you're dead. In history, that's Obviously not true, because there is a law we know about that was issued in 719 that told you that you have to wear left collar or right collar. Before that law was issued in Japan, actually it was more common to wear right over left. But in China, to wear right over left was um, regarded what uneducated barbarians do. So to change it to left over right by law actually was just trying to stand as an equal empire to China. A lot of laws that were made during that time actually just copied Chinese court gowns as they were. The garments that were worn by the normal population were actually just normal shirts and kind of skirts that were called hakama or mo for women at that time and those were usually made of hemp. During the Anlushan Rebellion in China, and I already know that's not the right Chinese pronunciation. During that time, Japan stopped sending envoys to China, which also stopped the cultural exchange between China and Japan. That resulted in something that's also known as the Heian nationalism. It was a time when Japan tried to evolve its own culture. That started with new characters that we're still using today, hiragana. It also changed the architecture of houses and also came down to changing the garments. And the most well-known garments from Heian era are the so-called Soktai for men and the Juni Hidoi for women, which were the most formal clothing for aristocrats. And those are still worn today. I have a video of the coronation gown that the emperor wore, and I have linked that video down below. As I explained in my kimono undergarment video, those two garments, the Juni Doe and the Soktai, are very important for us today because their undergarment evolved into the kimono we are wearing today. In Heian era, the Soktai was the most formal garment for noble men. And for less formal occasions, a so-called hōko or a ikan was worn. Both of them are worn with a sashinuki. That is a hakama that is tied up at the ankle, so it makes it easier to walk. Also, the ikan is worn with two layers less than a hōko or a soktai. For private occasions, noblemen of higher standing wore a so-called noshi and men of a lower standing or samurai wore a so-called karikinu. The noshi also has for a little more movement a sashinuki on the bottom and it also has the same amount of layers as a ikan. The karikinu was a garment that was worn when going out to hunt. So it was actually activity wear that changed into daily wear. 
And people of lower standing or samurai actually paired it instead of a sashinuki with a so-called karibakama. That is also tied up at the ankles but is tighter for more mobility. The nomad population wore a short hakama that was tied up at the knees and from waist up they wore something that looked like a hitatare, a garment I'm going to talk about in a few moments. During the next eras in Japan, civil war followed a civil war. So there were not a lot of changes made to garments, although they became a lot more simplified. And samurai of high standing started to wear very vibrant colors and outstanding outfits, which was or had been regarded as inappropriate. But during a time when you didn't know which day could be your last day, you wanted to be as fashionable as you could. So vibrant colors and very outstanding outfits was a thing for the high class samurai. So when we enter Edo period, there were not a lot of changes made regarding formal wear for the upper class. The sokdai was still the most formal garment for aristocrats as well as samurai that was now the ruling class. There was also a rank system for samurai introduced that told you what colors or patterns your ho, the top layer, could have. That system consisted of 12 ranks and the lowest rank again was divided in 28 samurai ranks. So this dress code made it possible by just passing by to tell if your opponent is higher or lower standing than yourself. And also what kind of garment samurai actually could wear was restricted within those ranks. So the most formal garments was a sock tie and the ikan. Both of them were equal high or formal garments and they were worn to the rank jugui no ge. The second most formal clothing was a so-called hitatare. And when you take a close look at it, you can tell that it looks quite different from a sock tie or a ikan because it doesn't use a hole on top which means it is not originated in a court gown, which also means it was not worn by the aristocrats, neither had it been a formal garment. It was originated in the samurai culture and raised with the samurai culture from the Kamakura period on. In the Edo period, it was worn by the shogun for New Year's or when he was interacting with envoys. And it was also possible to wear it until the rank Jushi Inoke. The next formal garment was a karikinu. Yes, it changed from activity to private wear to actually formal clothing. And according to one's rank, this would have been the highest or more, most formal garment one could have worn. The next garment is called daimon and its characteristics are the huge crests on top as well as on the hakama. It was made of silk and the hakama ties were white. And as you can see by the shape, this was also originated in samurai culture. The next garment, the suo, also originates in samurai culture. You can tell that the shape looks exactly like a diamond just without the huge crests, but it's made of hemp and the hakama ties have the same color as the whole thing. Lowest rank but still formal was the so-called kamishimo. It was more formal when it was paired with a very long hakama, the nagapakama, that was called naga kamishimo. And it was a little less formal worn with a kiribakama that was just a shorter hakama that was called hankamishimo. The kamishimo evolved from something that was called katekinu and is also originated in the samurai culture. Since colors and patterns were set for samurai, the only way to express creativity was their noshime. Noshime was the kimono or better said kosore that was worn under kamishimo, daimon or suo. And the part of the kosore around the lower waist that was not seen when putting on a suo daimon or kamishimo on top was the only part that was dyed in colors or patterns the wearer loved. And that pattern placement is extremely iconic until today. 
The daily dress for lower class samurai was a so-called tsugi kamishimo. There was a kamishimo and a hakama that were both made of total different fabrics. And this later on also became a formal wear for official work. But in the private space, usually a kosode and a hakama and a haori was worn, as well as just kimono, or better said kosode with a haori on top. And wearing a kosode with just an obi was actually only okay in private gatherings or at home. Not to mention that there were actually also several types of different hakamas and I have a video linked down below that introduces you to some of them. All of those dress codes and rules of course did not apply to the broad population. Normal working men would just wear a kosode with a obi on top. And very often the bottom hem of the kosode was tucked under the obi to hold it up and make it easier to walk and work. This is called shiri hashuri. Popular fibers were hemp or cotton. And when we talk about colors, blue dyed with indigo was very, very popular, as well as browns and grays. When we talk about patterns, I think the most what you see is check patterns or stripes. Different undergarments and dressing style again differs then from your occupation and your status. This dressing according to one's status rule actually has its roots in the society at that time. Men lived in a world that is called omote. That is a world that is standing up front and everyone can see. Women on the other hand lived in a world that was called Oku, which is hidden behind omote, which gave women so much more freedom for their garments. Men had to dress according to their status and their job, while women could just enjoy fashion and wear whatever they wanted to. And of course, the more money a family had, the more a woman could have fun with their kimono. This society shaped kimono for centuries and is the reason why it has never really changed. That's why for men today, still the most formal garment is a hakama with a kimono and a haori on top. And there is still worn this very narrow obi called kako obi. While women's kimono made an astonishing journey from junihitoi to the kimono we wear today. The obi width and length changed drastically. We had more obi arrangements due to that. The dyeing techniques and pattern changed. Um, different colors that were in trend in different years. And oh yes, there were so many more accessories and there stand in no comparison to men's kimono. And that is why I personally think that men's kimono are extremely boring. But hey, when you think about it the other way, men are still wearing the same thing Samurai did in history. And that makes a kimono today a very, very historical accurate garment. And that is actually pretty cool. In the Meiji period, Japan felt a setback against Western countries and tried to catch up. And westernization of clothing was one part of it. They started with changing the uniforms for the armed forces, which was also because war was in the air and the troops had to be ready any time. During Meiji era, many restrictions were issued against the samurai culture and even the very iconic hairstyle the chonmage was prohibited and this was to take the ruling power away from the samurai give it back to the emperor and eventually let the samurai vanish which worked out pretty well during that time western clothing started to have a huge impact on kimono as well for example the formal black was transferred or onto kimono. So the most formal garment for men became a black kimono with a hakama and a haori. And of course, with five family crests. The usage of family crests also became common during the Meiji era. Actually, crests could have only been worn by the samurai. And after samurai had vanished, crests became symbols for different families. So every family had a family crest. And this crest was used to indicate formality on a specific garment. Well, kimono. And today, actually, a family crest is not even tied up so closely to a family anymore. 
It is more an indicator of formality on a kimono than an indicator or a symbol for one's family. But I have a video about that and I will also link it down below. To wrap up this very long video about men's kimono, there were different dressing styles and various outfits for men in history, but they were tied down to very, very restrictive dress codes and only a small amount of people could enjoy that. And with the going on westernization, most of those formal gowns have vanished with the samurai. And today, the only thing that is left is a hakama kimono and haori as the most formal garment for men as well as the family crests that were made accessible for the broad population after samurai had vanished. <sighs> so I haven't edited it yet. This video took me a bunch of research. Um, I wrote the script in eight hours and I was shooting two hours today. So I hope this video is not too long. And the problem is that I still haven't mentioned everything that would have been mentionable. So there will probably be a catch up video and I hope you're looking forward to it. If you like this video, leave me a thumb up and try to ask more questions in the comments and I will try to actually reply. And yeah, if you want to learn more about kimono from a professional kimono teacher, make sure to subscribe and I'll talk to you in my next video. Bye.